But we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you guys for joining us today for the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. Um, we are, what, week four into this now for this academic year. And so we've had some, some really solid lectures. I just posted last week's video this morning uh, on YouTube. So if you want to go back and look at the previous videos, go back and uh, check out our YouTube channel. And we got them all up there. Um, but today, we are going to continue on with the resuscitation theme. We're going to be talking about the FAST exam, uh, a little bit about the basics, basically the FAST exam, basics and beyond. Uh, so we'll talk about some FAST exam you know, principles, and we'll talk about some cases that highlight some unique nuances, and I think it'll be a good discussion all around, and you know, we can take some Q&A at the end. Uh, but without any further talking about it, let's just dive right on into it. Um, and we'll talk about the FAST exam. So I know we have uh, various different people here on the, um, you know, in this discussion, you know, from from trauma as well as from the emergency department. And so I think this is a good conversation to have because, uh, I mean, this is what we see uh, day in and day out uh, as we take care of these patients. Uh, so we'll do the FAST exam basics and beyond um, and, and have a good conversation. So first off, no disclosures to make uh, on my part. Um, that are relevant to this discussion, so we'll just move on from there. So basically, today we are going to talk about trauma. You know, this is something that we see as a trauma center, and for those who are joining us on the YouTube uh, video and, and watching it in different ways, you know, I imagine that you see trauma in the course of your patient care, uh, which is why you want to watch this video and, and learn more about it. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of look at the, the FAST exam, how it integrates into the trauma workup, um, and what it really means for our patients and some of the nuances that we have to think through uh, as we're talking about the FAST exam and trauma because it's, I mean, it's not all cookie-cutter medicine, right? You can't just say, oh, FAST positive, FAST negative based on the traditional principles and, it, uh, you know, th there's obviously nuance, you know, with every patient. So understanding it better is going to help us be better at, at doing the study and, and applying it to our patients, right? So typical trauma bay after a big resuscitation, right? I think I just Googled messy trauma bay or something to that effect, uh, emergency department, and got this image. Um, but trauma can be a very hectic and very chaotic environment, right? There's um, that, that general principle of the golden hour, um, and you can define that in terms of whatever time frame, you know, fits whatever literature base you want to look at. But there's a very limited period of time which sick trauma patients, you know, give us to, to really intervene, right? And if you think about it, you know, think about trauma mortality. You know, obviously we don't, we don't want people to pass away as a result of traumatic injuries, but it happens from time to time. But if you think about trauma mortality, there's really a trimodal distribution of death along along this continuum. And I suppose you could probably flatten this out a little bit as you just kind of look at a bunch of data. But uh, in broad stroke, or broad stroke categories, um, you know, there's a trimodal distribution of, of mortality and trauma. And the first hump really comes on the scene, right, within minutes of the trauma. Uh, we can think of different scenarios. I mean, if you're shot in the heart, you know, it's you don't have a lot of time, right? Uh, if you have a massive head injury due to a high-speed motor vehicle accident, you don't have a lot of time. Um, I mean, my favorite ICD-10 codes in the catalog uh, are one of them happens to be fall from spacecraft. Um, look it up. It's there. Uh, and, you know, we were joking about this on shift the other day. Like, I, I suppose the context in which you have to apply this really matters, right? If you fall from a spacecraft you know, in space, maybe the weightlessness is, you know, negates the, the, the traumatic injuries that you could get. Uh, but if you fall from a spacecraft when you're waiting to launch, you know, gravity still is 9.1, uh, was it meters per second um, here on Earth. And so that's going to be a pr pretty significant traumatic injury, right? And so, I, I mean, I joke with this just to say, you know, there's, there's a certain degree of high impact injuries that are going to cause mortality uh, within the first minutes of the trauma happening. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, as much as we'd love to really flatten that curve, um, you know, there's not much that we can do in the hospital setting for those patients, right? There's a certain minimum amount of time that it takes to get from the scene to the hospital. And if you have a massive aortic injury, a massive head injury, a massive penetrating injury to a vital organ, you know, you may not have that time, right? So there's that first hump. We can't do much about that one. The second hump, right, about 30% of people uh, pass away within the first hours of their trauma happening. And I think this is what kind of gives, gives rise to that whole idea of the golden hour, the golden window uh, to intervene upon these trauma patients. And we really have a lot of 
um, opportunity to intervene upon these patients, right? Because they're going to come to us hopefully within a couple hours uh, of their traumatic injury. It takes a couple hours to get them from the scene to us, whether it be time, you know, time delayed to call or time delayed to extricate or whatever that happens to be, or time delayed to transport in some more rural environments. Um, but we have the opportunity to work on these patients. And then the the third window is you know weeks to, or days to weeks, right? And if this is this is a um, a window that in the emergency department we don't have a ton of control over, you know, because hopefully our patients aren't boarding with us in the ED for days to weeks, you know, on, on a you know high acuity trauma service. Uh, but you know, there's things in the ED that we can kind of set the stage for a better or worse outcome uh, in the trauma unit. And I was talking to one of my colleagues yesterday uh, about some literature that said basically for every um, you know, drop in blood pressure below a certain threshold, it increases the trauma mortality a certain percent, right? And so there's certain things that we can do to optimize the, the chances in the third hump, but really there's not a lot we can do in the ED for that because we're talking about sepsis and complications of end and trauma and things like that. Uh, and so, you know, we're not really going to focus on that. And I think the FAST exam really comes into play in helping us assess. It's a tool to help us assess patients in this middle hump, right? It's certainly not the only tool. And I think where those of us who really like ultrasound you know, struggle a little bit is saying, hey, the FAST exam is the best thing since sliced bread, uh, ignoring everything else. And I think what we really need to realize is, look, it is a tool. It's a very good tool. Uh, it's a helpful tool. But if you use the wrong tool on the wrong job, you're going to get, you know, get interesting results. And so in the same way that you won't, wouldn't use a hammer to screw in a screw or you wouldn't use a screwdriver to pound a nail, um, we have to apply it in the proper way. And we have to understand the nuances of the exam to know how the tool works most efficiently so that we can that we can apply it and use it for our patients, right? So with that being said, the goal of the FAST exam, right, the goal here is really best suited as a screening tool for fluid, right? So for hemoperitoneum, hemopericardium, hemothorax, and then one non-fluid thing, pneumothorax, right? There's a lot of literature about these uh, four different things that really help guide and direct, you know, the use of the FAST exam. And it's really predicated on this assumption that clinically significant injuries are associated with free fluid or free air, right? Now, we know that's not always the case, right? We know that there are injuries that can that don't produce free fluid and don't produce free air. And so if you start thinking through those and thinking through kind of what injuries, what that may look like and how these patients might present, we can start getting a clearer understanding of where the FAST exam may provide utility to us and where the FAST exam doesn't provide utility. And I think this kind of clarifies some of that ongoing debate between the ED and the trauma services saying, hey, does the FAST exam help me? Does the FAST exam not help me? And knowing what our outcomes are you know, for the ED and for the for the trauma service, and versus what we're trying to look for, will really help clarify that. Um, and I'll say this in two ways, right? Number one is just to show an article and say, hey, look, when you do an analysis of studies regarding the FAST exam, right? And this is a meta analysis, so it comes with all the baggage that happened that comes with meta analyses. Um, but when you met when you analyze the the utility of the FAST exam. Um, it basically gives us a pooled sensitivity of 79% and a pooled specificity of 99%, right? And you may say, hey, you know what? I'm not comfortable with a 20% miss rate um, on my sensitivity. Uh, and I think what this really illustrates is the fact that methods matter in these patients, right? So how you conduct the study and what you're looking for and your outcomes and your endpoints really affect how this tool performs, both in the literature as well as in your patient right in front of you. And so in this situation, obviously a meta-analysis, right? So there's baggage there. It's including all injuries, including solid organ injuries. Um, and it's looking to see if there's any evidence of significant trauma, right? And so if we go into it with that thought in mind, we're going to expect an underperformance. And that leads me to the second point that I was going to make. And that is really knowing your outcomes and what you're expecting to see, right? And so from the emergency department perspective, obviously, I'm not going to take the patient to the OR. I'm not going to um, you know, be doing a lot of interventions other than what I can do in the ED. And so to answer certain questions for me, uh, the FAST exam may be important, but when I'm trying to apply it to a different context, let's say our trauma surgeons for the, you know, for the sake of this example, whether or not they should take someone to the OR, whether or not they should do, um, you know, take them someone to the unit and 
you know, whether or not they have injuries or things like that, it has a totally different characteristic in terms of how it performs. And so the, the utility to an, a trauma surgeon may look different than the utility to an emergency physician. It doesn't really necessarily discredit the utility of the exam. It just basically shows that we need to, to know and to apply this exam uh, in the right way, really, and, and knowing what our outcomes are and apply it to outcomes that the, the, the exam can speak to, right? So all that being said, the FAST exam is a great tool that can serve as a screening tool for thoracic, pericardial, abdominal free fluid, or for a pneumothorax, right? And if we're looking for it to answer questions outside of this context, we're going to be somewhat disappointed. But if we're looking for answers inside this context, then I think we have a great tool that we can use at our disposal for patients who come into the trauma bay after they've suffered an acute traumatic injury, right? So with that being said, right, with that background in mind, let's briefly talk about the FAST exam in general. Like, and I know you guys are pretty well versed in how to do it. This is the, the introductory exam, as it were, you know, for point of care ultrasound and everything's just kind of grown and blossomed from there. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the FAST exam and then we'll follow that up with some cases that highlight some nuances in the FAST exam and various different things that we may need to consider as we're doing this in our trauma bay, in our you know, in our ICUs or whatever critical care environment we happen to find ourselves in. So the first um, window that we want to talk about, and this is just the normal FAST exam, is the right upper quadrant. This is kind of the, the classic window, the easiest window where you just put a probe down and boom, there it is, right? Um, the uh, the go-to place um, when we start the FAST exam. And people have often asked, hey, you know what? What order do I need to do my FAST exam in? Do I start at the heart and work around? Do I start in the right upper quadrant and work around? You know, do I do a you know, up, down, left, right? Do I go around a circle? You know, and I think we kind of wrap our heads around that too much and kind of get ourselves all you know, concerned about the order. When the reality is start where you're concerned that the injuries may happen to be, right? If they have an injury in the chest, start in the chest. If they have an injury in the belly, start in the belly. Um, start at easy, high yield places and then work from there. And so if you want to do go around the horn, if you want to go up, down, left, right, it, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, just start where you think the injuries are going to be and you know, work yourself out from there. So this is the first view, the right upper quadrant window. And in this window, we see the main target landmark is the liver, right? It's labeled there the liver. Uh, and the second landmark that we're looking for is the kidney. Uh, and the, the, the primary place, right, the place that you really want to look for, the classic, what's written about in the textbooks and in the literature place for looking for fluid is in Morrison's pouch, right? That that potential space between the liver and the kidney, it's, um, you know, that collects fluid when it's, when it's in the, um, you know, floating free in the abdomen. A couple other landmarks that you want to notice is the diaphragm, right, over just to the left of the liver. It's a hyperechoic line that's going to be just above the liver because that's really going to separate the pleural space from the, per um, the peritoneal space. Um, and, and you can see fluid on both, you know, the, the cephalad and underneath the diaphragm. Um, sides, you know, of that diaphragm, because you can look for fluid basically in the in the thoraces or in the in the peritoneal space, right? And so you want to really identify that landmark, um, or those three different landmarks, as you're looking at the right upper quadrant space. And so here's an example of a positive, right? On the left hand side, you see just a, a thin little faint stripe of fluid inside the Morrison's pouch or inside that potential space, the sp um, the hepatorenal space. And then you see in the left or the right hand image. Um, a, a triangle of fluid, you know, or anechoic fluid at the tip of that, that liver, at the caudal tip of the liver, uh, the caudal tip of the, the, the kidney there as you just angle downward. Uh, and so this is what free fluid looks like in the right upper quadrant. Right? This is an example of a positive fast. The second window is kind of the, you know, the twin, uh, as it were, of the right upper quadrant. That's the left upper quadrant window. Uh, and we're looking at very similar structures, obviously not the liver, we're looking at the spleen this time, uh, but you're looking at that spleen and that kidney and the interface between the two. With a couple exceptions, or a couple noted difference, right? The spleen tends to be smaller, uh, hopefully, than the liver. If it's bigger, then you got some issues um, outside the purview of this conversation, but um, it should be smaller, and it should also be a little bit more posterior and cephalad to the, you know, to the, in relationship to the kidney than, than the liver will be, right? So it's a little harder to find, uh, but it's certainly there. Uh, and you want to note that spleen, right? You want to note if there's any fluid above the spleen between the diaphragm and the spleen. If you want to know, you want to note fluid at the caudal tip of the spleen or in the splenorenal fossa. Uh, and again, you want to look at the diaphragm to see if there's any fluid above the diaphragm that would indicate like a left pleural effusion or left hemothorax, 
right? And so those are the major landmarks that you're going to look for as you're finding the spleen. Uh, and, and oftentimes people who are, especially newer trainees, have a hard time finding the spleen in the kidney, especially kind of getting it out from underneath the rib shadows. And so a couple different tricks to, to make the picture a little bit more optimally uh, arranged is to, number one, have the patient breathe if they can. That may help, pushing things down. But also just twist your probe uh, in line with the ribs so you can get you know out from you know, or get between the rib spaces. So the two o'clock position on the left and the 10 o'clock position on the right, they may help optimize your view of the liver and the spleen, right? So here's an example, a couple positives. Uh, so on the left, you see a small little bit of fluid at the caudal tip of the spleen, right? Over on the, um, you know, on the right-hand side of the spleen on that left image. There is some thought like, well, do you have some fluid above the diaphragm? And this one's kind of a tough one to call it. You definitely need to see it either in motion or in a, in a little bit more dedicated windows. Uh, my interpretation on this one is that it's probably a mirror image artifact of the spleen, you know, above the diaphragm, and that you know other in other windows in this particular study have indicated that it's there's no fluid up there. But you'd want to look up there for sure. Um, and then the right-hand image uh, that you see, um, you basically see a little bit of fluid kind of going above the spleen um, at the caudal tip and kind of, you know, between the spleen and the diaphragm as well. And so um, th two different places that you want to look for to see, you know, see fluid uh, for this splenic image, right? So that's the second window. The third window, uh, we're just going to go up to the chest, right, is, the, is looking at the heart. And this is the subcostal approach. You can also do it from the parasternal long axis approach. Uh, but the subcostal approach is really the classic um, quintessential view that's written about in the textbooks and that's written about in the papers. Uh, looking for pericardial fluid. And so you want to identify the left and right ventricles, which we see here um, and are labeled. And then you look for that bright stripe just deep to the left ventricle. Uh, and that represents the pericardium. And you should see, uh, you know, in a normal study, obviously a lack of fluid there, or in a positive study, uh, fluid that's, you know, between that, um, basically it separates out that bright stripe, you know, from the, from the, um, the left ventricle there. And so I like to remember this as, you know, the right ventricle is always superficial to the left whenever you look at it trans from a transthoracic perspective. Um, and you can, you know, to me, what, what makes sense in terms of memory aid is the left ventricle is the important ventricle. My apologies to all the right ventricle hypertension special or uh, right ventricle failure specialists out there. Uh, but the left ventricle is the important one. It has the higher pressures. It pumps blood to the systemic circulation. And so it's deeper in the body, a little bit more protected from the right ventricle than the right ventricle is, which is always more superficial uh, when you do it from a transthoracic approach. And so that's the way I identify it. Right ventricle on top, left ventricle on the bottom, and look for that pericardial space. And so for an example of a positive, here you go. Here's um, you can see a subcostal approach. You can see the LVRV uh, in the window there, in that stripe of black fluid or anechoic fluid that is basically encircling the heart that separates out the the ventricle, right, the the cardiac um, muscle from that pericardial sac, right. So that's a positive fast uh, there. And the final window, of the traditional fast, is the bladder view, right. And so this is a um, a sagittally oriented view of the bladder, right. You can see it has that kind of uh, conical funnel like shape uh, that the bladder typically takes uh, and we want to look for fluid um, posterior to the bladder uh, and this one happens to be a, a male right you can see the prostate uh, on the right hand side of the screen uh, and so there's obviously no uterus present here um, but you look at the same place right the uterus would basically be abutting the posterior wall of the bladder and so you look for fluid between the uh, bladder and the uterus or in this situation you look for it just posterior to the bladder or posterior encephalate to the bladder because that represents the peritoneal space where the, the fluid would sit uh, so here's an example of a positive fast right so you, the the circle of fluid right that's that represents the bladder right? that's contained fluid and you can see all that fluid outside of the bladder right which is uncontained fluid or fluid within the, the peritoneal space uh, representing a positive fast exam in this in this particular patient right so those are the four windows of the fast exam over the years as more research has you know has been done and more ways of using ultrasound has been you know, explored, the um, the concept of the EFAST has come into the literature, and that basically adds in the lung windows. And we talked a little bit about looking for fluid in the right and left hemithorax by looking above the diaphragm, but if you put your probe in the long axis on the anterior chest, you can find the pleural line, right? You can see that bright white line, which represents a pleural line, and see if it's moving, um, and if that represents uh, a pneumothorax or not. And so a pneumothorax would obviously be one where there's no movement, uh, where there ought to be movement, uh, as contrasted to the contralateral side where, where you hopefully see normal 
normal sliding. Um, and when you put the M mode on it, like we did here, you can get that sandy beach appearance or the kind of that speckled appearance in the far field and that very linear appearance in the near field representing uh, the movement of the lung relative to the chest wall. Um, you know, suggesting that this is a normal exam for, for this particular patient, right? So that's the basic FAST exam, right? That's what has been taught, you know, year after year um, in course after course about how to perform the FAST exam. And so if you read a textbook, that's what you're going to get. Now, the question is, do all patients obey the rules? And our clinical experience in other capacities would suggest that no, not all patients obey the rules. In fact, patients disobey the rules frequently, uh, and it's the savvy clinician uh, that really understands the nuances and how the principles apply and how they can apply those principles then to the, the particular patient. And I think, I mean, as I've thought through my own education and educating others, um, and even educating my own children, right, you know, we go to school, we learn the basics, we learn the one plus one is two, the, you know, ABCs and how to write your name and how to spell things. But really where you know you have mastery of a subject is when that knowledge, that baseline knowledge translates to something that's not the cookie cutter paradigm, right? When you can say, hey, you know what? I know this thing. I know this principle. This principle also applies over here, and I'm going to apply it even though the, the scenario is not exactly the same as what I learned, right? And so that knowledge translation, that mastery is then kind of the next step that we want to take uh, as we learn to understand the FAST exam and how to apply it to our particular patients. And that's where we're going to go with these next few cases, right? So let's dive right on in because I think this is where things get interesting, right? So the first case that we have is a patient. We, a kind of It's a made-up STEM, um, but it kind of represents a whole class of patients that we see. And so you can pick an age, you can pick a you know gender, you can pick a height, weight, whatever you want, right? Pick it. Um, but it's an auto versus pedestrian, right? The blood pressure is 100, and, 100 over 65. It's a heart rate of 95. The respiratory rate is 18 and the SATs are about 85%, right? Uh, so that gives us kind of this picture in mind of what we need to do for this patient, right? And so we're going to do a fast exam. And the first thing that we look at is the right upper quadrant view, right? So the right upper quadrant view, uh, you see on the left-hand side, the liver, and you see the kidney. And I don't know, is there a stripe between the liver and the kidney, or is it just kind of the, the different fascial planes? And, okay, fine, we're cheating. This is the image that I showed previously. But if you hadn't seen it before, this would be a tough in image to interpret if this was the only image that you were given, right? And obviously on the right-hand screen, I give you another image from this particular case. Um, and it's, it's challenging, right? Um, so let's look at the left-hand side. Uh, here's that left um, you can definitely see the spleen. You can see the diaphragm. There's no blood between the spleen and the diaphragm. Again, we're talking about that mirror image artifact up in the pleural space, but obviously it's a negative left upper quadrant view. So that leaves us questioning, like, okay, did we just waste our time, and you know, what are we looking for here? Um, if you go back to the right upper quadrant, look down, right? If you look down, you're going to see this image. And again, this is the image we saw before. Uh, but what we now see is at the caudal tip of the liver, some fluid uh, coming up the, the right pericolic gutter um, and about ready to get into Morrison's pouch. And you could probably make an argument that there was a small bit of fluid inside Morrison's pouch, right? And so that brings up an interesting paper, right? An interesting principle uh, of where does fluid collect inside the belly, right? Where's the most common place that we're going to see fluid inside the belly? Uh, and with that knowledge, with armed with that knowledge, then we can really focus in on those places so that we don't miss these potential positive FAST exams, right? So this is a paper that was published in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine uh, quite some time ago, um, 2016. Um, it's one of the favorite papers that I present um, teaching this principle of where does this fluid uh, reside. And I put the QR code there if you want to just, uh, directly go to PubMed and look for it. Um, but basically, these researchers look to see, hey, we're going to do these FAST exams. We're going to re retrospectively review all these FAST exams and, and define these locations within the FAST exam um, in each window and find the most commonly positive one, right? So they define the right upper quadrant to have three locations, right? So you see on here R1, R2, R3. So R1 is subphrenic fluid. R2 is going to be traditional Morrison's pouch. And R3 is the caudal tip of the liver, right? We've seen all those things on the exams that we're looking at right now. For the left, they did something very similar, L1, 2, and 3. They had the subphrenic space, the left up, or the, the spinal renal space, and then the caudal tip of the spleen as L1, 2, and 3. And then for the um, 
the super pubic window, they did the SP1 and SP2 and SP3. And really what they define that is SP1 is kind of the lateral edges uh, of the, the pelvic window. SP2 is between is posterior to the bladder, right? So for a male, just posterior to the bladder between the bladder and the rectum. Uh, for a female, it'd be between the bladder and the uterus. And then SP3 would be between the uterus and then the rectum. So I guess dudes don't have an SP3, um, but it represents kind of different spaces that you could collect fluid, right? And then they took their their anal- or took their studies, right? They looked at a total of 1,100 studies, uh, ran them through their inclusion-exclusion criteria, had about 1,000 studies that they were left with, and then evaluated those studies and said, okay, where did we see fluid on these different people? And really just plotted it out based on the different windows, um, you know, R123, L123, et cetera, uh, of where things are going to be, right? And this is what they found. They basically found that the most commonly positive place in the entire FAST exam was R3, right, the caudal tip of the liver uh, as they're looking for for the fluid. Second to that was the Morrison's pouch, right? And and again, you read the textbooks, and the textbooks say that Morrison's pouch is the common place where um, where fluid is going to collect. And while it's not untrue, I think the more common place is in that caudal tip of the spleen as fluids coming up the pericolic gutter, right? Interesting, and I was just, as I was reviewing for this today, I was kind of taking note, you know, of the other different windows uh, to say, hey, where do I need to look on these other ones? And so for the left, you want to look at L1 and L2, right? So it's going to be that, um, the the subdiaphragmatic space on the left. And then for the, the pelvic window, this is the one that I thought was interesting, is SP1 is the most common positive place in the in the pelvic window. So it's the lateral sides of the, the pelvis, right? You look just to the sides of the bladder. And so I think what this really illustrates is as you do your study, right, you really need to be carefully scrutinize all the different windows or all the different spots in those windows with particular attention to the diaphragm uh, and the caudal tip of the the, the liver, and then the lateral aspects of your pelvis, right? And I usually teach that the best way to do a pelvis is to do the sagittally oriented ultrasound and then fan from, you know, left to right or right to left, you know, from iliac crest to iliac crest. And while that's not wrong, I think the useful thing to remember is that fluid's going to be probably lateral to the bladder, um, you know, at least statistically speaking. And so you really need to not exclude that fan. You need to look in the middle, but also fan to the sides uh, and not just hang your, get hung up with just one window and that's it, right? Um, and so this study was reviewed um, by uh, Mike Pratz down at Ohio State and it's part of his um, ultrasound gel podcast. And he kind of put it in this nice visual format that displays the same information, um, but basically says, look at that caudal tip of the, sp- the, the liver, because uh, that's going to be the most common place that you're going to see things in the whole FAST exam and definitely in the right quadrant. So hot take, quick tip, probe on fire, get you to remember it, picture, right? Look carefully at the pericolic gutter. This is the most likely place that you're going to see fluid, right? So that's the take-home point for patient number one. Patient number two, right? We have another patient, um, who fell from a ladder. The ladder is about 20 feet in the air, right? Or the patient was 20 feet in the air on the ladder, uh, and they fell onto their left side, right? And again, we're gonna we're just gonna pull the same vitals over. You know, slightly hypotensive, almost tachycardic, respiration rate is 18, satting about 85%, right? Um, so now let's do the ultrasound and look and see what we find on this patient uh, and see what what nuances that we can pull out of this one, right? So here's a right upper quadrant window. It's positive, right? You see the caudal tip of the, sp- the liver. We learn something. Good. We look at the Morrison's pouch. Positive. We learn something. So are we done? I suppose, you know, like you can answer and say, you know, you need a, a minimum of fluid or fluid in a minimum of one window uh, to be positive. You know, but let's go on. Let's keep looking, right? So what about the left upper quadrant? We see the left-hand image here, right? And um, we see the right-hand image of the, the left upper quadrant. Uh, and as you look at this, right, that right-hand image looks kind of goofy, right? There's something untoward about that. There's something wrong with that image. So we focus in on that, and we can see there's a spleen kind of right in the middle. You see a hyperechoic arc or curve just to the left of that. That represents the diaphragm. And there's this hypoechoic, almost anechoic stuff that's between the spleen and the diaphragm, right? And that is free fluid in the left upper quadrant, right? That's the subphrenic fluid that we keep talking about in the left upper quadrant. And so this continues to be a positive FAST exam in the left, right? Uh, And so I think that brings up another interesting point that we should talk about. 
Um, and that is, where is fluid in the left, and where do you kind of, where does your eye naturally gravitate towards looking for fluid, right? And so this is a study that was published a few years ago. Uh, we talked about it uh, last year as part of the ultrasound, um, uh, what was it, the ultrasound uh, journal club. Uh, and, and it was a really interesting discussion. And I thought it was, it's kind of a uniquely done study. It's really interesting. It's very out of the box, not your typical, you know, Mikey likey study. Um, but it was basically, we're going to take a whole bunch of people, you know, people who do ultrasound, trainees and otherwise, we're going to put some really fancy glasses on them, right? And have them look at pictures of the ultrasound, right? And look and see what their eyes looking at, right? And see if they hit the different areas on the image that we think, as the, the researchers, um, are important to look at, right? And so they really divided up their the FAST exam into the same windows that we did before, R123, L123, SP1, 2, and 3. Uh, they may have called them something different, but it said we want to look at all these different places in the FAST exam because if you miss one, we obviously know from the previous study, certain places are more likely to be positive. So if you miss them, we need to actually retrain ourselves to go back and look for them, right? Um, and so what they did is they put these glasses on, they showed the the, tra the study subjects these pictures, and they analyzed where the study subjects looked on those pictures as they were assessing and interpreting this FAST exam, right? And so here's the results. And you can basically see that, um, you know, a, a large percentage of people got all the different windows a large percent of the time with one interesting and striking uh, exception, and that is the left upper quadrant L1 window, right? What we define in the other studies L1. So it's uh, between the the diaphragm and the spleen. And a lot of people missed that window, right? Which is interesting because remembering from the other study, that's the most positive window in the left upper quadrant, or most positive space in the left upper quadrant. Uh, and so I think it's helpful to know this, right? Know that your eye may not naturally gravitate there because a, a lot of our thinking is dominated by the right upper quadrant where we put it on, we're really hammering Morrison's pouch. We don't really see a ton of subphrenic fluid on the right upper quadrant. Um, for various different reasons. And so we really don't think about that or translate that knowledge to the left upper quadrant. And so I think it's helpful for us to know we really need to focus our attention to the left upper quadrant and focus there because that's where fluid's going to be and that's where we happen to miss looking for fluid, interestingly. Uh, so here's, again, that picture of the left upper quadrant where we can really burn it into our minds of saying really scrutinize finding the spleen, get a good picture of the spleen, find the diaphragm. It's not sufficient to find the splenorenal pouch, right? It's easy to say, oh, I found the spleen, I found the kidney, I'm done. No, no, no. You need to continue working until you've actually found the diaphragm above the spleen and really clear that area before we say that's a negative uh, window uh, for the left upper quadrant. And so with that said, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you, right? So here is another picture, right? This is a patient who has traumatic injuries to the left-hand side, right? And there's a left upper quadrant. And the question is, is this positive or is this negative, right? And as you sit there and look at it and think about it, I'm just going to go out and say it's a positive left upper quadrant. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think I have the ability to put a cursor on here. Uh, but if you look at the spleen, right, you can see a hyperechoic capsule to the spleen or a hyperechoic line to the spleen. But then above there, there is some, something of similar echogenicity to the spleen before you get to the peritoneum. Right? And this is called a subcapsular hematoma. So it's actually bleeding underneath the capsule of the spleen that didn't completely rupture out. So it's not free fluid. It's contained within the splenic capsule. But you see kind of that double contour to the spleen that represents this subcapsular hematoma. It's something that's very subtle uh, but easily missed if you're not specifically looking for that on the image that you're looking for or that you're looking at. So the take-home point for this particular case is be careful with the left upper quadrant, you really want to scrutinize that subphrenic space uh, as you're evaluating this window, right? So case number three, again, auto versus pedestrian, right? This time we're going to make them hypotensive, right? 85 over 30, a little bit more tachycardic, 100, uh, 110. Respiratory rate is 20, and their SATs are 95, right? So we do the traditional FAST exam windows. They're all negative. I'm just going to go out and say it. These are all negative. Now what do I do? Right? Well, move up to the chest, right? We're going to do the EFAST exam and look at what's going on inside the chest. And so the left lung, 
right? Here's the patient's left lung, and you see a sandy beach pattern. Right? You can see that speckled appearance on the, um, the far field. You see more of a linear appearance on the near field, representing the lack of movement in the chest, uh, or lack of relative movement to the chest, but presence of relative movement in the, in the, the lungs. Um, so that lung is normal, right? We have, we're good there. And we get to the right-hand side. Now what? Right? All we see is this snowstorm of, of just shadowing, right? And that's kind of what I thought when I first saw this patient. I was, this is was early in my career, right? I had a trauma attending over my shoulder. I was like, Matt, 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 what's going on? And I'm like, oh, great. I can't see anything between all this air, right? And then it dawned on me, I'm seeing air. All I'm seeing is air. And the patient's chest is such that I should see muscle, I should see ribs, and I should see a pleural line. But all I'm seeing is air, and maybe the Rice Krispies feeling on the skin helped, right? So Donna, this is subcutaneous, subcutaneous air, and the presumption there is that there's a pneumothorax underneath that, right? Um, and lo and behold, you know, a patient actually has a profound degree of subcutaneous air and a pneumothorax, and so they were, you know, fixed with a chest tube, um, you know, as part of their, their management for their trauma. And so I think that really brings up the question about what do we do with sub-Q air? What does that mean for us as we do the trauma, um, you know, trauma scan or the FAST exam, right? And so this is a study that was published years ago in the Journal of Trauma. Um, you'll probably recognize several of the people, or at least one of the people on the, the author list, uh, if you're familiar with the people here at our institution. Uh, but this basically, uh, they were looking at what is the, you know, what does sub-Q air really mean? Or what is the incidence of, of um, occult pneumothoraces? They're, they're looking from, from a different perspective. Like, you know, the patient has a pneumo. We don't see any clinical evidence of at least overt, right? What, what are the findings that may suggest that they have a pneumo, right? And the finding that they found to be most correlated with pneumothorax was, interestingly, subcutaneous emphysema, right? So in the situation of trauma, right, now, different if the patient sneezed or something like that, um, and I have a subcutaneous air. Uh, but if in the situation of trauma, if they show up and they have subcutaneous air, you feel that Rice Krispies, you know, feeling on one side of their chest or their neck or their torso, you got to give some thought to the fact that there's a pneumothorax underneath that, right? And you're certainly not going to see it with your ultrasound because your ultrasound is going to be stopped by the first little bit of air that you have in the patient's chest or the chest wall and not in the, um, in the pleural space. Uh, but you have to give some thought to some, to a pneumothorax, right? Now, Setting that aside, how does the ultrasound perform for pneumothorax in general? Um, I mean, the classic workup for a pneumo in the trauma bay is a chest x-ray, right? We get the patient in, you're laying on a backboard, we roll them off the backboard, and we say, hmm, let's get a chest x-ray and see what's going on in this chest. So we do a supine x-ray. How does that perform, you know, in... And is there something else that, you know, that would work better? And so this was a study that was done uh, by Mike Stone and his colleagues uh, looking at a meta-analysis of ultrasound versus chest x-ray for pneumothorax, and specifically the supine chest x-ray. So again, not the optimal way to shoot a chest x-ray, but there's actual validity to the test because this is, practically speaking, how we do a lot of these x-rays in our trauma resuscitation areas, right? And they showed that ultrasound had a sensitivity of about 98% uh, for pneumothorax. So that's really good, right? Compared to a chest X-ray, supine chest X-ray, that has sensitivity between 50% and 70%, right? So you're looking at about a coin flip uh, at the worst to you know about three quarters um, right at the best for um, for ruling out a, a pneumothorax based on a supine chest X-ray compared to ultrasound, which is nearly perfect, right? So that's great. Now, what about specificity? Um, ultrasound. Um, was close, right? I think it was it reached like 99% specific. So if you say there's a pneumothorax on ultrasound, it's probably there. There's a few other caveats and nuances um, that you have to consider. Um, but the chest X-ray, to, to its credit, did slightly outperform at 100%. So if you see the pneumothorax on, on chest X-ray, supine chest X-ray, you got it, right? It's there. Uh, if you don't see it, can't rule it out. Whereas an ultrasound, if you don't see it there, you probably are right. And if you do see it, you're still probably pretty close to right. Um, so I think the takeaway here is that ultrasound can be a helpful surrogate, you know, for chest X-ray when you're looking to answer the question, does the patient have a pneumothorax, right? And that's your only question, right? Um, now, if you want to look for other things like, you know, flail segment rib fractures or whatever else you want to look at, um, you know, then you have to, you know, give consideration to the test characteristics of that. But for a pneumothorax alone, I think ultrasound, you know, will outperform. And so if you see it, 
feel free putting that chest tube in uh, if you if you determine that it's a significant you know pneumothorax, which really begs us the next question, right? And again, we want to talk about the ultrasound and kind of go beyond and say how can we even make that scan better and more helpful. So, how can we use the ultrasound to actually quantify this thing? Because all right, you know the, the objection is okay, Matt, fine you can find pneumothoraces better, but you know what? You're going to find these apical pneumos that I wouldn't have done squat about to begin with, as opposed to the chest x-ray, which I see, if I see it, I know it's at least big enough to put a chest tube in, right? Um, and so this study was an interesting study by Vopicelli and colleagues, and he basically said, hey, you know, can we actually quantify the size of these pneumothoraces, and does it correlate with other forms of imaging? And so the idea here is you look for that lung point, you look for the point where you have sliding of the visceral parietal peritoneum, and then, or a pleura, excuse me, and then you lose that sliding, right? That the loss of sliding is your, the, the beginning of your pneumothorax, and that's the point, that's your lung point, right? That's the point where that pneumothorax you have it and you don't have it. And if you mark that and kind of work your way around the chest, you can actually mark this bubble of air essentially inside the chest and use that to quantify. And it correlates nicely with CT findings in terms of how big this thing is, right? And so, you know, do I take a Sharpie to all my patients? No, absolutely not. But I think what's helpful as we apply this patient or the study to these patients is say, okay, like, let's, let's put our probe down on the chest, right? Let's look anterior chest, highest place, which would be closer to the diaphragm. Is there sliding there? If there's sliding there, good. We're done, right? There's no pneumothorax probably in the rest of the chest. I mean, scan the rest of the anterior chest for sure because um, I don't like just one window uh, or one view. Um, but you're probably good, right? And if there's nothing across the entire anterior chest, you don't have a pneumothorax on that side, right? Now, if you put it there and you see lack of sliding, okay, you probably have pneumo, you know, excluding like apnea, um, mainstem ventilation, you know, pleuridesis, things like that, that will, you know, give these pseudo, um, you know, lack of sliding findings. Um, you know, assuming none of those are the case and you see lack of sliding, now we need to quantify this thing. So I usually go up and down the chest on the anterior surface and say, does it go across the whole anterior surface or just one small spot, right? Once I do that, then come laterally, and you can figure if you want to go like anterior axillary line, mid axillary line, then further, or just go mid axillary line, but basically find how far lateral in the chest that, that lung point extends. And then you can kind of grossly mark in your head how big this thing is. And if it seems to take up a large part of the chest, well, then that may be someone you want to consider putting a chest tube in versus if it's just a small little thing that you know, is contained within the, you know, a portion of the anterior chest, you know, fine. You can watch that one, get further imaging to further characterize. And so I think there's a way that you can use the ultrasound to help not only identify the presence of, the presence of pneumothoraces, but also help quantify the, the size of these things to help us make decisions of whether we want to put in a chest tube um, or not, or work it up further, or, or kind of what our management ought to be for these patients. So in this case, the, the take-home point is always be concerned about pneumothorax when you see sub-Q emphysema, followed by once you find the pneumo, don't, t don't stop, right? Keep looking for it and s see how much air is in that chest because uh, that may affect your, your next steps of your management even before you get further imaging, right? So the next case is going to be a patient who's involved in a motor vehicle accident, heavy front end damage. I mean, Paramex said like the car was demolished, right? There's maybe you could say some intrusion of the the engine compartment into the passenger compartment, you know, long extrication, you know, whatever, add whatever descriptors you want to this thing to make it really um, a, tra uh, a traumatic experience. Um, but the key is on the trauma alert that you have CPR in process, right? The patient has no spontaneous pulses and that you're actually doing compressions for them so that they can um, continue to maintain circulation, right? And so we get the, the um, ultrasound done and basically, this is what we see, right? We do the, the heart. And again, that was the most important thing because CPR is in progress. I don't really care what the pelvic window is at this point. I got bigger fish to fry. So here's the, the cardiac window. And we see a large echogenic cardiac effusion, pericardial, uh, pericardial effusion, which is basically the hematoma around the heart. But you still see cardiac activity. And you really don't see a lot of filling of the RV. Like the only thing that's moving there is really that RA trying to attempt to fill the RV just because it's completely collapsed by that hematoma there. So thoracotomy, right? Who wants to do that one, right? We're going to open up this chest, get this fluid out, um, and see if we can get the heart to refill and see if we can save save the patient's life. And interestingly enough, that was the outcome for this particular case. Um, you know, certainly it's not always the case. This is the 1% uh, that actually turns out well. Um, 
you know, but this is the, you know, definitely the place where thoracotomy is, is indicated. So the question is, right, does the FAST exam help me decide when to do a thoracotomy, right? Because the traditional teaching, and Casey, you could probably, um, you know, add a lot of detailed flavor to the conversation, but the traditional teaching is if the patient loses pulses within a certain time window of arrival to the ED um, or at the door, kind of whatever everyone's threshold is, then you open the chest, right? And the stories always, with the paramedics are always, especially when they're coming in in arrest, I don't know what was happening. We picked them up. They were doing fine. All of a sudden, like, as we were backing in, they lost pulses. I mean, there's some force field in the ambulance bay that just kind of zaps the life energy out of people because they always lose pulses in as they're backing into the ambulance bay. Um, but whatever the time course happened to be, you know, it's a factor in the decision making. If the time, if the loss of pulses is relatively recently, well, the traditional teaching is you open up the chest and you kind of open up all these spaces that are potential for tamponade or tension physiology. You relieve all that and then you see what you have left, right? Um, but the question was asked in this study uh, by Dr. Kinjianaba, um, I think he's out at UCLA, uh, was basically, does the FAST exam have a role in predicting who's going to survive a thoracotomy? or who's going to benefit from a thoracotomy. Because the thought is like, look, I can open, a, open up a whole bunch of dead people. They're still going to be dead, right? I have yet to resuscitate someone who was dead and is now alive, right? There's usually some spark of life left that we're trying to, you know, fan into a flame. Um, or the flip side is, who are the people among this subset who has that teeny little spark of life left in them that if I can do something, will fix them, right? And help bring them back. Um, and then we can talk about, you know, survival to ED you know, ED disposition, survival to hospital discharge and, you know, stuff like that. But who is like, who do I just say we're done? Like, it's not even like a, it, they're mostly dead thing. It's a all dead. And that any intervention would be number one, futile for the patient. But number two would be dangerous for our, our, our staff, right? Because this is not an innocuous thing, right? When you open up a chest, you have knives uh, or scalpels, you have needles or you know, a lot of sharp things that are flying around, not to mention like bone shards, um, you know, of fractured ribs that, you know, were probably part of what led to the patient's demise. And so this is a hurried environment. You have a certain time window to get into the chest. And, you know, we, unfortunately, accidents happen. People get poked and stabbed and hurt and, you know, it's, it's not benign, right? Uh, and so if I can avoid opening chests unnecessarily, I avoid that risk to my, my staff and my trainees. Um, but I do want to apply this intervention to people who actually need it because, you know, they need it, right? So that was the purpose of the study. They're looking to see, does the FAST exam help make this decision? Uh, and so they basically divided, you know, the uh, patients up into two camps. Number one, they called a positive FAST, uh, people who had uh, cardiac activity, or they had free fluid around their heart. Right? It's a pos positive fast. If you had neither of those, or if you didn't have those, if you had no cardiac activity or no blood, and this is where it's, the study is a little confusing, and I tried reaching out to the authors, and they sent me an answer back, and I'm not sure I completely understand it. I would probably put an and in there, but they put the, the or in their methods, so we're just going to go with or. Um, if you have no cardiac activity or no blood, they call it a negative fast, right? Um, and I suppose that makes sense, right? If, if your heart's beating and you have no fluid there, that would be negative. And if your heart's not beating, that would be, um, you know, bad. Uh, but for the purposes of the study, we're going to go with their definitions, right? And so they basically looked at their patients. Um, they had an N of 223. They um, whittled out a certain number of them who didn't get the FAST exam. So they're left with about 187 patients, divided them up between people who survived, people who um, passed away, and then people who were ended up being organ donors, because that's, I mean, maybe an outcome that's interesting, and said, who among those had a positive fast? Who among those had a negative fast? Um, and does this does this have any predictive factors, right? And so what I basically found out was that, um, you know, people who were survived, you know, were more likely to have a positive fast, right? And if you had a negative fast, you're more likely to have been in the expired bucket, right? The people who didn't, you know, didn't survive. And the specificity specifically for the elements of the FAST exam, cardiac activity or cardiac activity or free, slash free fluid, you can see that if you had, um, you know, for the people on the top chart here, the cardiac motion, no cardiac motion, compared with alive um, or dead, people who had... Um, cardiac activity, the only people that basically survived 
were ones that had cardiac activity. If you had no cardiac activity, you essentially did not survive, right? That is what we're trying to get at. Um, and the same thing with the, the fluid, right? They added a few more patients in that, that number, right? But if you had fluid um, or you had cardiac activity, those were s factors that suggested potential survival. If you had neither of those, right? If you had no fluid around your heart or no cardiac activity, you pretty much fell in that bottom bucket of, of no survival, right? And I think that it, it makes sense, right? Um, you know, if you come in and your heart's completely at standstill, you know, the, the process of dying as a result of your traumatic injuries has probably proceeded, to, you know, to a, a degree that it's become unsurvivable, right? Um, I mean, there's a reason why your heart's no longer even trying to beat. Um, or if you are coming in without pulses and you have no fluid around your heart, well, a thoracotomy is not going to fix that, right? The, the thoracotomy is designed to fix fluid around the heart. Um, and you could argue like you're going to cross clamp any order and things like that. But really at that point, um, you know, the, the thoracotomy is providing not much utility. You know, so if you have no fluid, if you have no cardiac activity, really think twice about, you know, doing the thoracotomy and just saying we're going to call the code uh, versus if someone coming in pulseless in arrest and has one of those factors, then then I think it's, you know, game on full court press and, and do what you can for your patient. You know, obviously trying to, to maintain as much safety for your, your staff as you can. So the take home point for this one is for penetrating trauma to the chest, perform a thoracotomy if you have cardiac activity or if you have free fluid around the heart. Right. Um, and if you don't have those, then you really have to think twice before you do it uh, and think about what are the other potential injuries that I might be missing if I focus in on the, on the thoracotomy right now and look for resuscitate towards those ends. Or if it's just too far gone, maybe that gives you the grounds to say, you know, this this is a, a non survivable you know, a, you know, code and we're going to call the code. So with that being said, that's kind of the the cases that we have today, the nuances that we want to look at for the FAST exam. But let's go back up and just remind ourselves the, the, the purpose of the tool and the best use of the tool, and that is the FAST exam is best suited as a screening tool to look for hemoperitoneum, hemopericardium, hemothorax, or pneumothorax, right? And if your traumatic injuries involve one of those things, then the FAST exam is a great tool. And if you think about it from the linear perspective of how we work up trauma, the ATLS, right? The, the initial presentation, the primary survey, secondary survey, you know, further diagnostic testing, a lot of this fits within that, at least the cognitive framework of the primary survey, right? Because you're looking for severe life threats, immediate life threats, um, things that you're gonna need to intervene upon now. Like, do I put a chest tube in? Do I open a chest? Do I start an MTP, you know? what do I need to do right now because this patient's crashing and burning in front of me, the FAST exam really scratches that itch and kind of fits that that niche, as it were, uh, to answer those questions in the primary survey. And then once we get beyond the secondary survey, um, then we, as we start cataloging injuries and trying to find all the ways that the patient is traumatized, then the FAST exam may start losing utility you know, as compared to other forms of imaging. Um, and I think having the understanding really helps us learn how to apply it best to our patients.